What's up guys, welcome to the best moments in Shenmue 2. Now this is just my opinion, I'd love to know your favourite moments in the game, so let me know in that comment box below. Let's take a look. Shamu 2 is as much about Ryo finding Landy as much as it is about him finding himself. It's a journey about growing, self-discipline, and understanding that revenge is not always the answer. Up until this point in the game, you've been tasked with seeking out information about a book titled Wu Lin Shu. This book is kept inside the Mammo Temple and under the watchful eye of Li Xiaotao. Ryo's persistence in gaining access to this book is pointed out by Li Xiaotao and ignites her intention to teach Ryo a valuable lesson about staying calm and patient. This involves Ryo trying to catch falling leaves from a tree. Now the blend of music and the hypnotizing manner in which the leaves fall prompt the player to stay calm and patient as they try to complete the task. This truly is a special moment in the game that captivated me and continues to prove that there is more to Shenmue than meets the eye. Towards the end of the game, you find yourself traveling to Guilin, a rural area of China that is well known for its unique mountainous landscape. Upon arriving, you encounter a young woman who goes by the name of Shen Hua, the mysterious lady that is seen in the previous game in some of Ryo's dreams. This chapter in the game is a complete contrast to the entire adventure and sees you walking through the peaceful forest area as you converse with Shen Hua and start to learn about her experiences and way of life. With the player given the option to ask to hurry on and get to your destination quickly, I would advise you to constantly ask Shenhua for information, as it reveals some very interesting facts about the area and its history. After heading to Kowloon, you learn the location of Yuanda Zhu. He's hiding in the Ghost Hall building, a place that admittedly has seen better days. With all the floors blown out, the only way to reach the objective is to shimmy across the wooden planks that litter each floor. Now I'm not gonna lie, it took me fucking ages to get to the top of my first playthrough, as while you're traversing the wooden planks, you are prompted by QTEs to regain your balance, and obviously the higher you go, the more devious the QTEs become. Upon reaching the 10th floor, you will meet back up with Ren, who conveniently found an easier way to get up. You enter Yuanda Zhu's office and are tasked with completing a puzzle involving the Divine Beasts. Now this is one of the most mysterious moments in the game. There are many items in the room that hint at Zhu and Awao's friendship, as well as the more mystical nature of Shamu's plot. Not many people know that there is a secret minigame that allows you to race against ducks, and it's easily missed as in order to unlock the ability to do this, you have to meet a certain criteria that most players would have skipped. I'm not going to waste time and tell you how to do this, as it is a very long process, but I'll leave a link in the description detailing everything you would have to do if you want to try this out. When you first enter the race, you are given the option to place a bet on a duck that you believe will win. They are all ranked from A to D, based on their speed, stamina, and guts. After you have placed your your bet, the race begins and sees the ducks running around the wise men's quarter until one of them crosses the finishing line. There is also an option to actually acquire your own duck, which you can then enter into the races. The only difference being you will have to actually control it around the course. Soon after entering Wan Chai, you come into contact with a martial artist practicing in a park. He is of the Tai Chi style and invites Ryo to spar with him in order to gauge his martial arts knowledge. Tai Chi is known for its slow movements and peaceful practice, so as you can imagine, Ryo is hesitant to take up Jan Mian on his offer. After a tense sparring match, Ryo comes to the realization that Tai Chi can also be used to attack, and is told that it begins with softness and slowly develops into force. It's not until later on that you meet Jan Mian again while seeking information about the Wudu. He teaches you Gan, the principle that states to practice every day without neglect, and he stays true to his word, as you can always find him practicing Tai Chi in the park throughout the game. Now most people dislike this part of the game, but I see it as one of the game's finest moments. While staying with Li Xiaotao, you are tasked with clearing out the books in the temple every morning and receive a book of new moves after completing the labor. This section sees the introduction of Li Xiaotao's intention to teach Ryo about patience, as she is worried he will lose himself in his obsession for revenge. And this is translated to the gameplay very nicely, as if you try to keep running with the books, the intensity in which the QTEs appear increase. But if you take it slow, the task becomes easier with less demanding QTEs. I love the way the game does this with the player throughout the adventure and goes a long way to immerse yourself in the world. 
This is one of my favorite sequences in the game that sees you trying to escape the Dancing Dragon building after a supposed meeting with Yuanda Zhu herself. This is the first time we are introduced to Don Yu, the man in charge of the Yellow Head Gang. He states that he is also looking for Yuanda Zhu and decides to keep Ren and Ryo captive. After being thrown into a small room and locked up, Ren and Ryo need to devise a plan to escape, the only problem being they are handcuffed together. Despite this, they manage to fool the guards with Ryo pretending he is dying and embark on one of the most epic QT sections in the entire series. That sees you forcing your way through enemies and around corners until you reach the exit. Some interesting character development takes place between Ryo and Ren as you start to learn more about him and his knowledge of events. After a final encounter with Don Yu and assaulting a transvestite, you make it safely back to Ren's hideout. It feels so good to be talking about this part of the game in 2016, with the knowledge that we are finally going to be getting Shenmue free. Now this was the cliffhanger to end all cliffhangers. After arriving in Guilin, you make your way through the landscape to Shenhua's house. After preparing some food for her father, she takes it to the stone pit where he is working. Unfortunately, he is nowhere to be found, which prompts Shenhua to search the area. They stumble across a letter left for Shenhua by her father, letting her know that his work is done and that the time of destiny has come. He has left an item known as the Sword of Seven Stars with the letter and prompts Shenhua to take it with her. The sword reveals a pillar that the Phoenix Mirror can be inserted into, which results in the biggest mindfuck in the series. Two giant carvings of the mirrors created by Shenhua's father reveal themselves as the ancient sword starts to glow and float. After all of the realism present within the games, it was such a shock to see the scene play out. And now finally we shall get some answers with Shenmue 3. Fang Mei is an orphan who is adopted by the temple and works there to repay their generosity. Through optional dialogue that I totally advise you to carry out, it becomes apparent that Fang Mei has a crush on Ryo. Fang Mei will start to call Ryo by his first name instead of Hazuki-san, pointing out to the player that she is becoming comfortable and fostering a relationship. She will often ask you what you like. This can range from your favorite food to your thoughts about Li Xiao Tao, but be careful not to say the wrong thing as she will become moody and begin to ignore you. When Ryo is about to leave Hong Kong and head to Kowloon, if you have fostered a relationship with Fang Mei, she will open up to you and confess her true feelings. She gives Ryo an amulet that she found whilst being taken into the orphanage and wishes him luck on his journey. The interactions with Fang Mei are vital to unlocking the duck racing, so it's a good idea to carry this out if you have the intention of accessing that mode. As soon as you step off the boat and arrive in Hong Kong, it becomes apparent to the player that things might not be as easy as they were before. Ryo is stepping into the unknown, leaving the comfortable confines of Yokosuka behind and embracing the harsh reality of tracking down his father's killer in a volatile environment. Being harassed by photos you never asked for, your bag getting stolen, the hostel you were staying at closing down, the list goes on and I think it's a great subtle way of presenting this idea to the player, which helps develop Ryo's character after the events of the first game. That's not to say it's all bad though. When I first got off the boat, I stood and listened to the street performer play his instrument. I went shopping and bought some virtual arm figures and topped it off with a friendly arm wrestle. In other words, the opening moments of Shamu 2 are grounded in reality and go a long way to introduce the new themes that are present within the game. This time, you're on your own. Well that was it guys, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel for more videos like this in the future. I will see you next time.